Today we come to the final sermon in this series of the book of Revelation. I'm a bit sad, which is a little strange because when we started the series, I was rather nervous looking forward to the end before we had even begun. I didn't really know how to preach through this book, but I've been strangely encouraged and surprisingly challenged in my study of this text to the point where I would tell you that I think it's probably one of my favorite uh, series since I've been here in the past seven years. Now, I fully realize that some, maybe many of you, may not feel the same way, particularly uh, for those of you that may take a different interpretation of the various parts of Revelation, and you've been thinking, when is this series going to end? And I can respect that. I, I can appreciate that. But my heart has been warmed by this book personally and as your pastor in wonderful ways over these last three months. And frankly, I don't want it to end. I kind of wish we could continue with Revelation. Uh, isn't that beautiful with this book of Revelation? The, the book is only the end of the beginning. I love the way C.S. Lewis put it in the last paragraph of his Narnia series. He wrote, The things that began to happen after that were so great and beautiful that I cannot write them. And for us, this is the end of all the stories, and we can most truly say that they all lived happily ever after. But for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. Now, at last, they were beginning chapter 1 of the great story which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. The end of Revelation is just that. It is the beginning of a story where every chapter will be better than the one that came before. And in a sense, that's the point of the book of Revelation. If we study this book, if we read this book rightly, it will inevitably leave us wanting more. And so what I want for us to do today is to take a quick glimpse at chapter 1 of the great story in which every chapter is better than the one that came before. The first thing that we see in this story that never ends is that we're going to live in God's perfect place. You heard Cindy read these verses a moment ago. Revelation 21 and verse 1, John says, And then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. It's really kind of amazing. The first two chapters of the Bible talk about creation and the creation of heaven and earth. And the last two chapters of the book, of the Bible, in Revelation, also talk about the restoration of a new heaven and a new earth. Eugene Peterson, many of you recognize his name as being the one who wrote the paraphrase Bible called The Message. He wrote uh, another book called Reversed Thunder. And in it, he put it this way, the biblical story began quite logically with the beginning, and now it draws to an end also with the beginning. The sin-ruined creation of Genesis is restored in the sacrifice renewed creation of Revelation. The product of these beginning and ending acts of God are the same. The heavens and the earth in Genesis and a new heaven and a new earth in Revelation. And thus the story of the Bible has creation at the beginning and also has creation at the end. There are two very important words for us to understand here. One is the word new as it relates to a new heaven. And the other is the word earth as it relates to the new earth. In the Greek language, there are two words for the word new. Uh, the first word is a word called neo. Uh, and in that word, it means uh, new in time or new in origin. You might recognize or be familiar with our English words 
neoclassical or maybe um, in the hospitals with neonatal care. Um, neoprene is another word that comes to mind, a kind of a, a new synthetic rubber. Um, neo. The other Greek word for new is kanos. And in that word, it means new in quality, fresh, uh, as in a fresh opportunity. Um, new in the sense that there's been nothing found exactly like this before. And that's the word that's used here. So we're not looking at a world that's brand new. We're looking at a world that's been renewed, that's been refreshed, that's been made new in quality. A world that's superior to anything that's ever come before that we've experienced since. After all, remember, there wasn't anything wrong with the world that God created to begin with. When He finished and He looked at His creation in Genesis, what did He say? It is good. It's all good. And when He restores this world as it's meant to be, I believe He's going to say it again. It's all good. God isn't going to take this world as many of us believe and dump this world into the trash can and start over. He's going to restore this world to the way that it was meant to be. And that's where we're going to live forever. In a similar way, there are several words in the Greek language for the word earth. The first is the word kosmikos. You might hear cosmos in that, kosmikos. It actually means the world of politics, the world of business, the world of entertainment. We sometimes refer to things as being worldly. Uh, kosmikos is that word. The second word is the word eon. Uh, that word also might sound familiar to you. It's uh, a word that we use to refer to a, a space of time, and an era of time. But the word that John uses here in the Greek is the literal word for the physical earth, the planet that we live on. And, and the Greek word is G or Gi. Uh, we use that Greek word G as a prefix for our English words geography or um, geology is another word where we connect that Greek literal meaning. It's the dirt. It's the rocks. It's the mountains. It's the, the stuff that we see in the tangible part of this earth that John uses here. And we live in a world that is polluted. It's polluted physically. It's polluted spiritually. And the perfect God lives in a perfect world. And a perfect God wants His people living in a perfect world. Everything around us, everything that you and I experience today, the atmosphere, the planets, even our own resurrected bodies are going to be upgraded beyond anything that we could imagine. Pastor and, and author James Merritt tells the story about going to Scotland on a 10-day trip to play golf. And one of the places he got to go, of course, was the famous St. Andrew's uh, Golf Club. They were actually staying there at the Old Course Hotel. There were 12 guys in the group and they were staying two to a room and everybody was given a room key except for Dr. Merritt and his uh, buddy and they kept waiting for their key and they began to notice that several of the employees were kind of scurrying around rather hurriedly and uh, with a very frustrated look on their faces and after about 20 minutes Dr. Merritt said that the staff came and said we're, we're so very embarrassed we're so very sorry to tell you this but we don't have a room for you. Dr. Merritt thought that that meant that they were going to be staying in a Motel 6, but instead the staff said, please follow us. And they took them up to the top floor of this hotel and walked them into a 1,200 square foot suite. It was massive. It had every amenity you could imagine. In fact, it had two balconies, and over one balcony you could look all the way down almost the entire golf course. And if you knew anything about golf you could look over one of the balconies onto one of the most famous holes in the entire world the hole i believe it's number 17 you golfers correct me if i'm wrong called the road um, hole and dr merritt writes we could not believe our good fortune 
All of our buddies were having to sleep in single twin beds, almost side by side, in small rooms that could have fit into our bathroom. Whether you're flying in an airplane or staying at a hotel, getting ready to spend eternity somewhere, there's no sweeter word than the word upgrade. We're going to live forever in God's perfect place, an upgrade unlike any we've ever experienced. And then John adds this strange and unique detail at the end of Revelation 21, verse 1, and the sea was no more. I don't know about you, but my family loves going to the beach each year as part of our vacation. We have to get away to the beach. If we don't go to the beach, it just the year just feels odd. And I hear an awful lot of moaning and groaning around the house when we don't get to the beach uh, over the course of a year. It's one of the best places that we go. But have you ever thought about why the oceans exist and why John might say that there was no more sea? Over 70% of the surface of our world is covered with salt water. The average depth of our oceans is three miles. Why does the earth need all of this salt water? The answer is because our world, physical world, needs to be cleansed. The earth is bathed in what you and I might call a, an, an antiseptic solution. It's composed of 96% water, 3.5% salt, and about 05 of other stuff. And that salty brine of the ocean not only cleanses the atmosphere, but it also provides for the rain that we receive. If you think about how the cycle of the earth works, how many pollutants and the waste that we produce and how all of that gets washed into the soil and our streams and our rivers and ultimately finds its way out to sea, it almost serves our oceans as a great septic tank that absorbs and, and scrubs and brings down and breaks down all of those pollutants. The sun then heats up our oceans and brings out of it pure, clean water vapor forming clouds and sending it back via the way that the winds move across our oceans to the land that that rain would fall on our land. You have this continual cycle of cleansing and renewing. But John says in the new heaven and the new earth, there won't be any need for that. Because there won't be any pollution. There won't be any waste. There won't be any need for cleansing and thus no need for a sea. Folks, God thinks of, of everything. And He says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. A new heaven and a new earth. But secondly, we're going to live not only in God's perfect place, but in His perfect presence. This new heaven, this new earth is going to have a, a capital city. It's the same city that's always been God's city. You heard the choir sing about the holy mountain, Mount Zion. John says in Revelation 21, verse 2, And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, that is Mount Zion, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. This city comes straight out of heaven where we're going to live. And it isn't of our own making. God is the architect. God is the builder. God is the interior decorator of this city. It's the promise that Jesus made when He said to His disciples, in my Father's house are many rooms. John chapter 14. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and I prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am you may be also. This is the result of God's work. is His city. It's a beautiful city. And it's prepared according to this text as a bride adorned for her husband. This wedding imagery that we receive from John. We all love weddings and the climax of any wedding is that moment when the bride makes her entrance and comes down the aisle for everyone to see or she comes out, if it's outside, comes out from around some hidden place. 
That word adorned there in the Greek is the same word that we get our English word cosmetic from. You've never seen a more beautiful city than this city. That's why she's called a bride. I've, I've done my fair share of weddings and I can honestly say I've never met a bride that wasn't beautiful. Now I've married a few that just barely made the mark, but truly every bride is beautiful. I really believe that even God is excited and can hardly wait for the moment when He reveals and unveils this city to His people. And don't worry about all of us having enough room to fit in there. If you look at verse 16 of Revelation chapter 21, it tells us that the city would be an exact square of 1,400 miles. That's large enough to contain the landmass from the Appalachians to the California coast and Canada to Mexico. It's going to be 40 times the size of England, 10 times the size of France and larger than India. That's just the ground floor. In fact, um, if the city is stacked one layer upon itself as a builder of a city would today with floors, this holy city would be over 600,000 stories tall all within this cube of 1,400 miles. So if you're one of those people that tends to interpret Revelation from a more literal perspective, rest assured there's plenty of room for God's people of every nation and tribe and language and culture and tongue. Everyone in God's city. For those of us that see Revelation from a more symbolic perspective, point of view, just know that this city represents the enormity and the completeness of the kingdom of God. What makes this city so magnificent, however, isn't that it's big or beautiful as much as it is who it is that lives in it. Notice verse 3 of Revelation 21, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be His people and God Himself will be with them as their God. For the first time, all of God's people who live in the immediate, perfect presence of God, our eyes will see Him, our ears will hear Him, our hands can touch Him at that moment, our our lips can kiss Him, we can feel His Embrace literally will never leave His presence. He'll never be out of sight. He'll he'll never be out of mind. It'll be like the next door neighbor. God will be always present. Always there. And some of you may be thinking, well, don't we live in God's presence now? And isn't He always with us? And the answer, of course, is yes, but not completely. Not fully in His perfect presence as we will experience in that day, even though He's present with us, we can only see Him, we can only experience Him today by faith. But when we all go to the new Jerusalem, the one coming down out of heaven, we'll see Him with our eyes, we'll hear Him with our ears. He'll be with us the same way that He was with Adam and Eve when He walked with them in the garden. I know that even that song for many of you is a song that that just resonates in the garden when the dew's still on the roses and you've heard it at funerals. And in that same way that that song speaks of us walking and talking with God, you'll experience it in this new city. We'll actually live there, walk and breathe and live in His presence. God's perfect place. His perfect place presence is ultimately going to lead to living in God's perfect peace. Notice verse 4 of chapter 21. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. It's kind of strange when you consider how John describes heaven. 
He tells us what's not there as much as He tells us what is there. There's a place that's going to be dramatically different from anything that you and I have ever experienced. And rather than tell us what's going to be there, John tells us in a verse of a number of things that won't be there. First of all, there's no sorrow in heaven. I've walked into too many homes of grieving spouses or hospital rooms with parents who've been informed of children's diagnosis or any other number of scenarios. Folks, there is nothing more gut-wrenching. There is nothing more speech-imposing than hearing the wails and cries of people whose lives have just been decimated and turned upside down and shattered. Hearts are broken. I want you to hear me today say that in heaven there will be no more tears. There will be no more mourning. There will be no more crying. Folks, there will be no more pain for all of eternity. There will never, ever be any sadness again in heaven. Only gladness. Thomas More was a 17th century poet. And he wrote these words that have been picked up since then by a contemporary Christian artist named David Crowder put into a song that he wrote called Come As You Are, but Thomas More said, Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Folks, death will be no more. John says, death shall be no more. Picture it, folks, no more tears. No more death, no more pain, no more sorrow. Imagine a world with no insurance. Imagine a world with no hospitals and no hospices. No cemeteries and no gravestones. No funerals or funeral homes. The health care plan that we've recently heard numerous times talked about won't be called repeal and replace. It'll just be repeal. There won't be any need for that anymore. No more need to worry about drive-by shootings or murder or terror attacks. No need for Gun control. The reason why there will be no more sorrow and no more death is ultimately because there is no more sin. Look at verse 27 of chapter 21. Nothing unclean will ever enter that city, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Ultimately, the reason there's no death and sorrow and sin is because there is no sin. Living in a world where everybody is not just good, but where everybody is now once and for all perfect. A world where there's no arguments, no lawsuits, no confrontations, no fighting. A world where no one ever needs to be forgiven. And a a world where no one ever needs to forgive because there will be nothing to forgive and Nothing to, per, to be forgiven of. If we go back again to the first two chapters of Genesis, we'll see that Adam, our first father, lost all sorts of things. And when we get to the last two chapters of Revelation, we see that the second Adam, that is Christ, gained for us so much more than the first Adam ever lost. This is the story of the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, God created us so that we could connect with Him, but because of sin, we became disconnected from God. And ever since that sin, the world has been filled with sorrow and death. And so what does God do? He sends His Son Jesus to die on a cross and to take care of our sin problem. And then He raised Christ from the dead to take care of Not only our sin problem, but our death problem. And one day He's coming back to restore the world to the way that it was meant to be. 
to take care of our sorrow problem. And so God is taking care of our sin problem. He's taking care of our death problem and He's coming back to take care of our sorrow problem. Do you long to be in the presence of God? Do you look forward to a time when these words will be true for all eternity? No pain, no sorrow, no sin, no death. Only joy and eternal peace. Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Jesus said in Matthew's Gospel, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everybody who says that Jesus is Lord of their life will enter the kingdom of heaven. There are pretenders out there. The question for you and me is, are we pretending or have we thrown our trust? Have we thrown our faith at the feet of the cross of Christ? Jesus goes on to say, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of the Father in heaven. The answer to that question is, the will of the Father is to accept by faith the work of the Son. That's the will of the Father. Have you done the will of the Father and accepted Jesus Christ? Confess your sin. Turn to Him. Trust Him. Throw your very life at His feet. And ask Jesus to save you. And then look forward to chapter 1 of a story that never ends. Let's pray.